Hello everyone, welcome to Archaea Viking. So now is the second example for the day of what I call uh, early colonial debacles that disprove the myth of inherent European superiority. <laughs> With the subject of this video being uh, titled The Dragon Devours the Bear, the story of the Qing Dynasty of China's victory over the Russian Empire in the mid-17th century. So, when we hear the terms China and Russia, uh, in our modern minds, we probably tend to think of the countries as we know them now, uh, with this being modern China um, <clears throat> and this being modern Russia. However, as always, our pre preconceived notions of countries as they existed in the modern era are rarely the truth, or at least the full truth, of the countries throughout their history. So, before we can look at the conflict between uh, the Qing Dynasty of China and the Russian Empire, uh, we have to first look at the rise of these two empires. So, the Qing Dynasty of China usurped the Ming Dynasty of China in 1644 CE, though they had been uh, expanding from their homeland here in the Dark Purple, uh, at least from the 1620s CE, before finally uh, usurping the Ming Dynasty of China in 1644 and taking over most of Northern China and eventually taking over all of Southern China uh, from 1644 to 1690 and eventually expanding out and taking control of most of Central Asia uh, in uh, from 1690 to 1750. <clears throat> and during this period of time, much of the Qing dynasty's military was made up predominantly of cavalry, with lower-ranking soldiers being generally unarmored horse archers, as seen here, though uh, the higher-ranking Qing military officials were also horse archers, though they had much better armor, as they were tended to be wealthier and could afford, afford better armor because armor was expensive. Uh, though they also did utilize uh, infantry units, as seen here, uh, of course, the infantry units were often still archers, uh, the, uh, which were generally made up of Mongolian and uh, Qing, uh, Manchu, um, <clears throat> so I don't know why they air quotes, Qing and Manchu uh, soldiers uh, who utilized the Mongolic and Manchu composite bow, as well as uh, Chinese and East Asian broadswords known as Dao's. Uh, they also had access to gunpowder weapons, um, which they, of course, uh, received from China. Uh, in fact, it's important to note that while um, that while the <laughs> Qing uh, military was often uh, uniformed in this way and often looked in some regard uh, like this. Uh, that in the initial decades after the conquest of the Ming Dynasty, uh, much of the Chinese military under the Qing Dynasty probably still dressed in uh, the style of the Ming military, as seen here. Uh, and as you saw in the last two pictures, the Qing Dynasty had access to gunpowder weapons such as muskets, as well as uh, gunpowder artillery such as cannons, which greatly allow, which greatly helped them in their conquests of much of East Asia and Central Asia. Uh, with the uh, with the primary opponents of the Qing Dynasty uh, before contact with Russia being uh, nomadic. Uh, steppe horsemen such as the Mongols, uh, as well as Ming loyalists and rebels such as Kozenga, who was a powerful warlord who held 
control over much of the southeastern coast of China and most of Taiwan, uh, which meant that the Qing dynasty had to very quickly adapt a navy in order to deal with uh, Kozinga, who was in fact an admiral in the Ming army, uh, with, them, with the Qing dynasty eventually in the 1680s defeating Kozinga's uh, kingdom, specifically his son, uh, in combat and conquering Taiwan. So the Qing military was, in fact, a fairly diverse uh, and well-trained uh, and experienced military. Meanwhile, across the continent, another imperial power was on the rise, specifically that of the Muscovite state of Russia, also known as the Tsardom of Russia, which first began to rise uh, here in the light gray um, in the 1530s uh, through the 1680s, uh, eventually by the time of the 1680s, gaining control of the uh, of this tan area as well as parts of these red areas. And the Russian military at the time was generally made up of Slavic uh, speaking peoples as well as um, peoples who were descended from the Mongol conquerors of the Golden Horde, uh, such as the Cossacks uh, and various other ethnic groups, and generally their military garb was something akin to this. Uh, they used uh, battle axes and halberds and of course utilized uh, gunpowder weapons and uh, curved uh, scimitar-like blades. Uh, and you can sort of see what uh, types of units they had here. As well as here, they all, of course, they also had access to artillery, uh, such as cannons, that you can see here. And these are, in fact, officers that you, well, sorry, this is an officer of the Russian army that you can see here. And the at this point in time, before contact with the Qing dynasty, uh, the Tsardom of Russia's primary opponents were other European and Western powers, such as the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, itself a superpower of the time, as well as the Ottoman Empire, which by the, 15, uh, by the late 1500s uh, pretty much controlled most of this area. Uh, here are... Uh, cavalry units of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, uh, much like the Mongols uh, and the uh, quote-unquote Tartars or descendants of the Mongol Golden Horde uh, in Russia, the Lithuanian Commonwealth uh, still used predominantly cavalry um, because Russia and other offshoots of the Mongol Empire uh, and Golden Horde were predominantly cavalry armies. <clears throat> Uh, and so was the Ottoman Empire. So in a very similar way to the Qing Dynasty, uh, Russia was very experienced in dealing with cavalry opponents. Uh, and eventually, as these empires began expanding into Central Asia and uh, parts of Central Asia that are now called Siberia, these two superpowers would, of course, collide. Uh, and this would happen during uh, the reigns of several rulers of both of these kingdoms, with uh, the conflicts between Russia and the Qing dynasty happening during the reigns of the Shunzi and Kangxi emperors, uh, and during the reigns of Alexis of Russia, Theodore III of Russia, and Peter the Great, uh, with this being Alexis, and this being Theodore, and this being Peter. And much of this conflict that is the subject of today's video would be fought over the Amur River Valley, or the Amur Darya Valley, as you can see here. And this collision be uh, between these empires would begin as a result of two Russian expeditions 
the expeditions of Vasily uh, Poyorkov, which occurred in 1643 to 1644 CE, and then the later expedition of Yerofe Kovarov, which occurred in 1649 and 1653 CE. <laughs> uh, this is Vasily Poyorkov, and then this, uh, this is Yerofe Kovarov. And uh, their expeditions were initially just expeditions of exploration. However, they found that the region of eastern Siberia, that is the Armadaria River, was very resource abundant. And so they immediately began making plans to set up trading posts and colonies there, very similar to, say, how the Hudson Bay Company would um, in Canada. Uh, because it, this area was abundant in furs and timbers and things like that. However, it's also important to note <laughs> both of these individuals and their expeditions were pretty brutal to the to the indigenous inhabitants. Those being Mongol, uh, ver the various Siberian ethnic groups, uh, and the various Mongolic ethnic groups. Uh, in fact, during his expedition, Yerofei Karbarov uh, built a fort at the area known as Albazan um, around 1652. And as a result of this building, of the building of the fort, uh, Fort Albazan, uh, a, the Qing dynasty would see this as a violation of their territorial sovereignty, and they would dispatch a army, an army to lay siege to, uh, uh, to Albazan itself. However, uh, Yerofei uh, Karov was actually able to hold off the Qing army um, and prevent the Qing army from breaking into Albazan itself. However, <laughs> it should also be noted that um, when uh, the ice began freezing over, uh, freezing the river over on the back end of uh, the fort of Albazan, uh, uh, Karbarov withdrew further north, away from Abazan, so he knew he couldn't hold off forever. Mm -hmm. uh, and as a result of this, he was removed from uh, from control from leadership. Uh, he he was he, his leadership of the fort was uh, taken away from him, and an individual known as Onofri Stepanov was left in charge of the Russian garrison. Uh, however, a Qing general by the name of Sarahuga uh, would lead an expedition uh, that lasted from 1653 to 1658, specifically a naval expedition using um, paddle boats. Because yes, they had, because yes, the Qing dynasty had large naval, uh, ocean-going naval fleets, uh, but those were too big for the rivers, even with taking into account that the rivers of East Asia are generally large enough for ships to pass through, similar to, say, the Mississippi River. Uh, it was still the the naval ships of for ocean-going battle were too large, so uh, Sarahuda used uh, paddle boats, uh, and he gathered this fleet and took these paddle boats north um, defeated the Russian forces in several uh, skirmishes and battles, killing around two to three hundred Russian soldiers and killing uh, <clears throat> Onofri himself, um, at least temporarily halting uh, Russian uh, expeditions of control into the area. Uh, here is an example of sort of what the armaments of the steamboats would have looked like, because, of course, as I said, the Qing military did have access to gunpowder weapons. So, of course, you can imagine uh, a R Russian soldier is camping by a river, and suddenly a steamboat you know, armed to the teeth with cannons comes up and just starts opening, opening fire on them. Uh, it would not have been a pretty sight. <laughs> While the victories of Sarahuda against uh, Ofre uh, and the Russian garrisons at Albazan and other areas did temporarily put an end to European uh, to Russian expansion into the Armadaria region of eastern Siberia, it did not 
permanently end it. In fact, it, it would be surprising if it did, because uh, to the Sardom of Russia, the region was too valuable to give up. After all, it was very resource abundant, and it could potentially provide the Tsardom of Russia with a lot of wealth. And so as a result of this, uh, Russian incursions into eastern Siberia began to increase uh, with, uh, with, with border conflicts becoming increasingly frequent. In fact, um, the Qing military noted during this time the marksmanship of uh, the Russian soldiers, specifically the Cossack soldiers, as well as the fact that the Cossack soldiers themselves being partially descended from the Mongol Empire, as well as other Turkic groups who settled in what is now modern-day Western Russia, they also, the Cossacks also fought in, as cavalry archers as well. So as a result of this increased uptick of border conflicts, uh, the Shunzi Emperor and eventually his son, uh, Kong, the Kongzi Emperor, began to plan multiple large-scale expeditions into the region to permanently deal with the Russian threat. And during this time, during this planning, they looked to one of their tributary states, their most loyal tributary state, in fact, the Joseon Dynasty of Korea for help. Now, the Joseon Dynasty, as we talked about in the video on the Joseon Dynasty, as well as the video about the Imjin War, uh, the military of the Joseon, of the Joseon Dynasty uh, was very similar to what you would expect the Ming Dynasty's military and eventually the Qing Dynasty's military to look like. Uh, Higher-ranking soldiers had better armor that was often brigantine-type armor, um, armor that uh, cl uh, cloth armor that had metal plates riveted in to the cloth, or say lamellar armor or scale mail, both of which are very similar, uh, which are just uh, plates that are interlocking on top of each other. Uh, and lower ranking soldiers having simpler armor like say chain mail or gambeson. Uh, in fact, the Joseon army was also oftentimes um, cavalry based and based off of cavalry archers because of their uh, near constant contact with the Mongolic uh, and Manchu tribes of the Eurasian steppe. Uh, in fact, this is sort of what Joseon cavalry would look like. Again, you can note their use of the Mongolian and Manchu composite bow. Uh, with cavalry generally using the Manchu uh, and Mongolian composite bow, as well as uh, long range we well, long weapons like spears and other pole arms, uh, while the Joseon infantry would utilize weapons like the again the composite bow, um, broadswords like the East Asian Dao, um, as, as well as other pole arms like spears and such. But the primary reason for the Qing recruitment of the Joseon military was not their archers or their um, infantry that utilized swords. It was their gunpowder infantry. And that's because, as I talked about briefly at the end of the Imjin War videos, uh, after the Imjin War, uh, as a result of um, exchange between... Uh, China and Joseon Korea, the Joseon Dynasty of Korea began to reform its military into a gunpowder military. Uh, and so and so much so that by the time of the reigns of Shunzi and the Kangxi Emperor, the Joseon Dynasty was the most powerful or the most the best trained East Asian gunpowder army in all of the region. And they were incredibly skilled with their gunpowder weapons. Um, and these are generally how their infantry that used muskets would have looked like. And they themselves were noted in a similar way that the Cossacks were. They were noted by the Cossacks as being incredibly skilled and deadly marksmen. They were actually called by the Russian soldiers uh, the big-headed demons, um, named specifically after the types of helmets that they wore. 
and and this and so with that in mind, this is sort of what like the combined Joseon Ching army would have sort of looked like. You know, some infantry, some cavalry, and a lot of gunpowder uh, forces. And with the and once they gathered this highly trained allied force of Chinese and Joseon Korean forces. Uh, Shunzi and eventually his son Kangzi would launch several devastating expeditions uh, against the Tsardom of Russia's forces, defeating them at battles such as uh, Yuan Hala, Hu Tong, and Kumar, eventually forcing Russian forces all the way back to the Fort of Albazan by 1685. Which, of course, led to the event known as the Siege of Albazan, which lasted from 1685 to 1686. Uh, you've already seen this picture before, but this is um, the picture in its full context. So, once they forced all the Russian forces back to the Fort of Albazan, uh, the Kangxi Emperor ordered his Joseon and Qing Chinese commanders to lay siege to the fort in earnest. And it should be noted, it was a fairly hard-fought battle. After all, it lasted about a year, but then again, most sieges are that way. And eventually, after concerted uh, bombardments and harryings and various other things that involved um, that are involved with sieges, eventually the Qing and Joseon forces were able to break through uh, Fort Albazan and force the Russian forces completely out of the Armadaria River Basin. Uh, and they stayed there, stayed out of that area for the next two years until the Qing dynasty forced the Tsardom of Russia to sign a, a document known as the Treaty of Nerch Chinst. Um, apologies for possibly butchering that. Uh, named after the region of Nerch Chinst, which is the region that uh, the Russian forces were forced to withdraw to after the defeat at Albazan. <clears throat> here is the a copy of the document here. <clears throat> As a result of this treaty, Russia, the Russia, Tsardom of Russia was forced to uh, was forced to cede all territory south of this black line right here in the pink. Which, of course, resulted in uh, the Qing Dynasty of China growing, I don't want to say exponentially, but growing much larger than it was even to begin with. In fact, by the time of, of the conquests of Central Asia and Siberia and Mongolia and such by the Qing Dynasty were completed, this is what the Qing Dynasty looked like. And as you can see, it controlled a good chunk of what is now modern-day Russia, as well as, of course, parts of um, Southeast Asia and Taiwan and such. And it would remain this way for around 169 years. However, by 1858, the Russian Empire uh, would expand as China itself was suffering from multiple defeats at the hands of Britain, the U.S., and France. And as a result of those defeats and China's decline, the Russian Empire would be able to sort of reassert itself and first uh, retake control of the area in yellow as a result of the Treaty of Aigun in 1858, and then completely retake control of the rest of the Armadaria River region uh, as a result of the Treaty of Peking in 1860. And here's modern-day Russia here. However, while this happened, um, and much like uh, the previous video on the Cambodian defeat of the Spanish Empire and the Dutch East India Company, uh, it should be noted this happened a hundred. This re Russian reconquest of the region happened a hundred and sixty-nine years after they suffered several large-scale defeats at the hands of the Qing Dynasty, as well as after the Qing Dynasty was already weakened by internal conflict and other large-scale wars against. Uh, more arguably more your more powerful European powers like the like the U.S. Yes, I'm counting the U.S. as a European power, 
you, I will not change my mind on that. <clears throat> uh, but other more power, arguably more powerful European powers like the U.S., England, and France. So, in other words, that shows that <laughs> while Russia was able to regain control of this region over here, um, it was by no means a foregone conclusion that Russia and other European powers would come out on top. In fact, for much of the colonial period, it actually looked like Asian powers like China would be the ones who would come out on top. Okay, so with that, that ends this video. Uh, if you want to see me cover the Russian Empire um, or um, the any of the other countries I mentioned, such as the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth or the Ottoman Empire in greater detail, uh, please feel free to leave a comment in the comment section. Uh, you'll note that I did not mention the Qing Dynasty because I have plans in the next few weeks to do in-depth videos on the Qing Dynasty. So that, that's already going to happen. Um, and uh, with those in mind, I hope that you enjoyed the video. And remember to like, share, and subscribe. And I hope you all have a good day.